The words gifted and talented are probably among the most controversial in the field of education. I don't think that a single week, week goes by that I don't get an email or a telephone call uh, from a parent, from a teacher, an administrator, uh, occasionally a person in policy making positions that is asking about who's gifted, how do we identify who's gifted, how do we provide services to uh, gifted and talented students. Uh, my journey in this field really began uh, back in the 1960s when I was in graduate school. And at that time, there wasn't a lot of controversy about who was gifted and who wasn't gifted. They used IQ cutoff scores. The standard usually was 130. If you had a 130 IQ, welcome to gifted land. If you had a 129 IQ, sorry, sorry you didn't make it. Um, however, one of the things that I've done ever since I was a child was read biographies and autobiographies about the lives of people of great accomplishment. And also observing many of the young friends that I had, people that I went to school with, people that I worked with. And I began to think about the fact that there has got to be more to the making of giftedness than just simply IQ cutoff scores. Some of the early uh, works that I read uh, had some interesting uh, stories. Um, just to give you a few examples, and there are literally dozens of these. Uh, as a boy, Thomas Edison's teacher told him he was too stupid to learn anything. He said of school, I remember that I was never able to get along at school. I was always at the foot of my class. I used to feel that my teachers did not sympathize with, with me, and even my own father thought that I was stupid. Louisa May Alcott was once told by an editor that she could ne never write anything that had popular appeal, and Walt Disney was fired by a newspaper editor because the editor said he didn't have any good ideas. Even Einstein, who we all worship because of his great intellect, uh, was four years old before he could speak, seven before he could read. He was considered dull by his parents and teachers, and he failed an examination that would have allowed him to become a teacher three different times. All of this really led me to eventually develop uh, an article that I wrote uh, in the 1970s called What Makes Giftedness? Reexamining a Definition. And in this article, I pointed out that there really are two types of giftedness. And I divided these into two categories. One I called high achieving giftedness. Those are students who learn extremely well, who have very good test scores, get their homework done on time, typical teacher pleasers. Uh, the other uh, are what I call creative productive giftedness. And the case studies that I just reported to you are all people who were considered to be highly creative and productive. One of the more recent uh, studies that uh, I want to bring to your attention is uh, this year's Nobel Prize winner, Sir John Gurdon. Uh, Gurdon uh, has an, a letter that he keeps at eye level above his desk. It was written in 1944 when he was just a, a high school student, written by one of his teachers. But uh, the letter, uh, I'll read to you, the print on the screen might be kind of small. One such piece of his work, the teacher writes, scored two marks out of a possible 50. His work has been equally bad, and several times he has been in trouble because he will not listen but he will insist on doing his work in his own way. I believe he has ideas of becoming a scientist. On his present showing, this is quite ridiculous. And so I think that these are all examples that uh, I tried to point out uh, in my work in the development of a theory which is popularly known as the three ring conception of giftedness. And what I pointed out in this theory was that Highly creative, productive, as opposed to lesson learning giftedness, is really a combination of an interaction between and among three different clusters of traits, which you see in the diagram. The one that really surprised me the most was the one in the upper left-hand corner, because what the research tells us is that many of the creative, productive people, again, referring back to my very brief case studies, come from the above average but not necessarily superior levels of ability as measured by tests of intelligence and aptitude. 
The second is creativity, the ability to generate lots of different ideas, to challenge convention, to challenge existing ways of doing things. And the third cluster of traits uh, is task commitment. And think of this as a sort of focused form of motivation. Uh, motivation in psychological terms refers to a general cluster of traits. You're motivated to be a good parent or teacher or member of your church. Task commitment is that energy more like a laser beam focused in on something very particular. And there are a couple of quotations that I like to share related to both of these things when it comes to task commitment. The artist is nothing without the gift, but the gift is nothing without the work. And then again, an Einstein quote related to creativity, imagination is more important than exercise. Anyway, uh, I, I wrote this article in the 1970s and it was ceremoniously, unceremoniously rejected by uh, all of the journals in gifted education that report on these kinds of things. Um, I sent it to a general education journal and it was accepted and fortunately the article got legs and it started to result in some changes uh, in the gifted field. Uh, a story that I like to tell is a number of years ago, I was the president of an organization called the Associ Association for the Gifted. And when you're the president of one of those things, you get on the mailing list of all kinds of uh, companies that want to sell doodads to your organization. And I got an uh, uh, invitation from the I Love You gift company that you could buy neckties that say I love you on it and coffee mugs and all of those kinds of things. But what always fascinated me, and I keep this at eye level above my desk today, is the way that they address the card. Uh, I, I am that person. Uh, however, what I have argued uh, is that we should be looking at a much broader range of characteristics than just uh, academic uh, test scores. And um, I say today with no small amount of immodesty that the article that I wrote in 1978 is now the most widely cited article in the field. And this is important to me because the field itself has changed its mind. The field has talked now, talks now much more about the development of giftedness or the development of gifted behaviors in young people. And this brings me really to the second theme of my work and this work paralleled the development of the uh, article on the three ring conception of giftedness. And the, uh, this is a model for developing giftedness in young people, which is referred to as the enrichment triad model. And basically in this model, what I've said is that in order to develop giftedness in young people, we have to give many, many more people than just people with high IQ scores, some general kinds of enrichment which in this diagram uh, I refer to as type one and type two enrichment, and the ways in which young people respond to these general types of enrichment will determine whether or not they should take step two or step 12 or step 22. So type one enrichment is exposing young people to different issues, ideas, topics, names, dates, places, events. It could be something as simple as a cartoon that appeared in yesterday's newspaper that might turn a child on and cause that child to want to go further. Type two enrichment uh, relates to a broad range of thinking skills and creativity, cre uh, creative problem solving, learning how to learn skills, research and reference skills. Uh, these are really the tools that highly creative, productive people use to carry out their work. And so we should be providing these with a, uh, to much larger groups of young people and again determining whether or not they want to do some kind of follow-up once they've developed these kinds of investigative skills. The real payoff in this model is called type three enri enrichment, individual and small group investigations of real problems. And in this case, there are four characteristics that make a problem real. And one of those is personalization of interest. In other words, it's something that the young person is interested in rather than something that's part of a standard prescribed curriculum, which is what so much of school is all about. 
The second thing is that they're going to use authentic methodology to investigate this. And this is where the role of the teacher becomes so important. How do you go about carrying out an investigation that may, for example, require you to develop a sophisticated questionnaire to get people's attitudes about dress code or about bullying or some other topic? The third thing is that there is no single predetermined correct answer. Uh, so much of school is finding the right answer, what's going to show up on the test, what the teacher will evaluate as correct or incorrect. And the fourth thing, and this is really what I think creates the motivation or task commitment to cause young people to continue to work long and hard, oftentimes overcoming many difficulties and obstacles, and that is that there has to be an audience other than or in addition to the teacher that they're going to send something out to be published, that they're going to enter it into a state or national or regional science fair or robotics competition. Uh, the creative, productive person always works with an audience in mind. And so when people ask me uh, what are the best ways to develop giftedness, uh, one of the things I say is uh, we, we need to use what I call the concept of or, opportunities, resources, and encouragement, but always within the area of the interest of the young person. This is what makes giftedness in a creative, productive sense. I also believe that one of the things is that we have to train teachers to use more words like the following in their teaching. Words like create, uh, <laughs> dramatize, construct. You see the words popping up here on the screen. And I think that these, again, are the things that cause us to create giftedness in young people. I do not believe that we can create giftedness in all young people. I also don't believe that even in the same person we can create it all of the time. I believe that we create it in certain people, not all people, at certain times, not all the time, and within certain circumstances or within certain contexts. The people that history remembers as being great contributors have always been people with a singleness of purpose, usually working in a very particular area. And I'm open to any questions that you might have about this always controversial topic. Thank you very much.